Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, I, I saw it just there. So thank you for inviting us. When we, um, <clears throat> I'm Jeff Billings, I'm the IT director. And uh, I appreciate working for you all. And when George uh, Gonzalez first uh, approached us about maybe doing this, uh, we titled it uh, Information and Technology and Learning, Classroom, Home and Beyond. So it kind of fits uh, given the uh, current uh, conditions. And uh, so we'll try to go through that. Uh, there's a couple of students and the assistant director, Sam Doyle, joining us. And I'm going to ask Oceana and Allie to just come on real quick and say hello. Turn your camera. I guess they prefer to have camera turned on here. One of the things that we try to tell as many people as possible is if you don't need the camera, turn it off because there is local, regional, and national and international bandwidth consumption going on. And I know that cameras are good for face-to-face -face and for teachers to say hello to a student, et cetera, but we try to be good digital citizens and respect bandwidth. So I'll turn my camera on real quick. <laughs> Y'all can see me in all my glory, sorry. Uh, I haven't been uh, shaving uh, here lately. So uh, with that, I'll turn it off and ask Oceana and Allie to come on and say hello. Hello, I'm Oceana Covington. I'm currently a sophomore at Paradise Valley High School. And I'm, a, I'm also one of the WIT students, as well as in the Cyber Patriots program. And now I'm also on the data government, the data governance and cybersecurity task force. Allie, are you on? Okay, well, uh, we'll wait. If Allie jumps on here in a little bit, we'll try to catch her. Uh, just organizationally, this slide shows who we report to, and uh, that's Dr. Uh, Dan Corson in curriculum instruction. Functionally, IT reports to all, all cabinet members because um, we're involved in, in their operations in a very deep and, and rich way as well. The department consists of a director, that's myself, and assistant director Sam Doyle, who will be joining us in a second. And we have uh, 30 staff ranging everywhere from network services to data, state reporting, site support, you name it, and a few other duties as assigned uh, as of this last few weeks. But uh, the next slide uh, was one of the first things we launched was a distancing website when the uh, uh, closure uh, was announced. And, and uh, that site deals with everything, a heavy emphasis on the adopted curriculum that we utilize and the online resources that are there, uh, but also information related to grading guidelines, uh, parents, teachers, frequently asked questions and support. The school closures, this kind of gives you a feel of some of the other things we've, we had to do. We had to immediately shift web filtering to cl uh, cloud and home-based versus school-based. And uh, we had to train on uh, essential tools, uh, essential resources, G Suite, WebEx, Meet, which has started Google Meet, which is probably going to be a web conferencing system that many, if not most teachers will prefer, I think, but not all. And we utilize Google Classroom quite heavily. We've also had to distribute over 11,000 instructional packets, printed packets, for those who don't have internet. And as part of that, we've um, pre-approved over a thousand uh, Cox applications for free home internet access. And that process is moving as well, as well as handle phone and online support. And we had to do all of this uh, while respecting social distancing protocols. So it has been a, an interesting challenge uh, that the department has stepped up to, and I'm proud to be a part of them. If we go on to the next slide, you'll see some of the impacts in terms of metrics. Uh, we're averaging about 1,500 uh, web accessions a day now. We've had, I don't know, a little over 15,000. You'll see that we didn't have a lot uh, coming into March 21st, 22nd. And then it started increasing rather significantly. And I, I think you'll see the same pattern with Google Meet, if not higher. A little more fluid tool within the instructional environment. WebEx uh, has a lot of features, but um, teachers need a five or six key features. 
and perhaps don't need some of the other features that WebEx provides. You see Gmail there uh, coming along, and then boom, it increased uh, significantly. On March 30th, I think we had uh, a little over half a million emails received. So communications were occurring between teachers and students is probably the biggest bang, uh, biggest part of the increase. And you'll also see classroom posts with over 13,000 posts also on March uh, 30th. So really seen an up ramp or an uptick uh, in, in that information. Uh, I've gone to the next slide, just some of the history highlights so that you have a little sense of the department. We serve on Cisco's and Google's North America K-12 Advisory Council to help guide and help shape that platform. Uh, you may not know, but we were the first K-12 in the nation to use Google's G Suite and one of the first five in the nation to use Chromebooks before they were called Chromebooks. Our students worked with development teams. It was really quite, quite exciting. Uh, that the students actually worked with the Google development teams in developing the Chromebook. Uh, we're also on the Sun Corridor, which is big, high fiber bandwidth that connects ASU, NAU, and um, University of Arizona to the Internet, too. So we are directly connected there. That just means better quality service, uh, cheaper, bigger, faster. And uh, thanks to y'all, uh, we now... Uh, invested and own our own fiber to all the schools, which uh, provides us the, the best capacity to fulfill bandwidth uh, that, that there is right now based on physics. Uh, fiber is the best. Uh, there's also the Center for Teacher Development, and we're starting to bring some voice to text artificial intelligence into a Center uh, for Teacher Development which will make uh, finding particular practices of teachers that much quicker. Uh, we've started doing cloud-based video surveillance, and we worked that with the district's emergency response team and the Phoenix Police Department. We also have 24-7, 365 uh, cybersecurity monitoring. These things are unique in the K-12 space, and it's thanks to your investment and, and, and encouragement to make us move forward. Uh, with educational technology uh, is what allows us to do this. The next slide um, is, ooh. Thank there, you, Jeff. Yeah, there was one more. I added one more slide. I guess we didn't get it in there. Huh. Uh, I did want to say uh, real quickly, sorry, Sam, and then I'll let you have it. No, all good. There, there was a slide I had put in, I guess, at the last minute, but cybersecurity continues. Um, We've got about 12 uh, accounts right now that are being attacked by robots. <laughs> At least I think they're bots. A thousand tries in, uh, of trying to log into an account the last 24 hours. We've had over 107 phishing attacks in the last 24 hours. There's crypto mining, not much, but a little bit. And malware, we've blocked 183 sites from, black, uh, from malware. So while we have to provide reliability, uh, we also have to address cybersecurity and data governance. And you'll hear more about that from the uh, the students here in just a second. So with that, Sam? Hello, all. Sorry, I jumped in a little bit late. But um, so I'm just going to kind of take a brief minute to talk about the work that we were doing prior to um, COVID-19 in our current situation, but uh, knowing that we're still going to move forward with it. So. Um, I have, I, I am responsible for leading ITC, which is the um, Information Technology Committee for the district. And of that, we've branched off into two work teams, um, really kind of defining what our purpose was as a committee and then what are our, some of our goals. And then from there, we realized that we needed to invest a little bit more time and effort into those two specific things. So the first one being standardizing technology. Um, and where the need for this came is um, prior to this year, um, schools were given a, a budget, a technology budget, and they were able to use it however they saw fit. What we saw um, from a district standpoint is when you go to classrooms um, across the district, depending on the site, you'll see um, students have different technology in front of them. Um, so from anything to display, you'll see a wide variety of flat panels. Some are interactive, some are not, some have Wi-Fi, some do not. 
Um, in addition to, you'll see projectors. You see projectors on rolling carts, you see um, ceiling mounted projectors. Um, and what we're trying to do is we're trying to pull this in and bring some sort of standard to where we're creating a base. Now that doesn't mean that schools can't use their money to go above and beyond that base, but um, just ensuring that, um, for example, if you have a fourth grade student, that no matter where your fourth grade student decides to go, they're going to have um, they're going to be um, they're, uh, they're going to have that base standard for technology when it comes to student devices, when it comes to display. Um, this this is. A hot topic for a variety of reasons. One being um, equity. We want to create equity across all of our sites. Um, in addition to that, for teachers, knowing that like if a teacher moves from one site to the other, they're not going to have to learn a whole new interface and learn um, how to use new technology for whatever classroom they're in. Um, and then from a, also an IT standpoint, um, when we have such a variety of flat panels or displays, it makes it really hard to support all of the different um, models and or makes of uh, what are in our classrooms. So really just trying to use every stakeholder's voice. And um, we, we put out a survey to our teachers to figure out what are some priorities and where do we want to start our work. Um, and then from there, creating sort of, sort of these grade band standards. Um, we, for example, we know that kindergarten is a unique um, animal, so, so to say. And so we know that kindergarten um, is going to have a lot different needs than a senior um, AP classroom. So understanding that depending on the grade level of the of the classroom they're going to have different needs and we want to make sure we address those so um, that's kind of been our work and uh, it's been slowed a little bit with our current situation um, but this is uh, this is continuing forward um, given it's obviously not going to we're not going to snap our fingers and have this standard across all classrooms by next year it's going to be kind of a phasing in process to where once we determine what that standard is as things kind of deprecate, we we replace them with that new standard. So um, that's been our big work with that work team. The next work team is our one-to-one -to -one to take home Chromebooks. So uh, with the passing of the bond, we wanted to um, make sure that we were investing bond dollars um, appropriately and uh, being very innovative. And so um, what we decided, uh, and direction from cabinet was that we were going to start with 7th through 12th grade and this we may dip lower um, but that's just kind of our base so we want to make sure that all 7th through 12th grade students um, have access to chromebooks um, and this would be like the take-home model so they would get their devices as freshmen in high school um, and they would that that would stick with them they would take it home every single night they would be able to um, complete homework assignments and um, it, it would really open up the opportunity for teachers as far as assigning um, classwork and making it more creative and um, interactive. So we're looking at Dell Chromebooks and the goal is that within five years we have all 7th through 12th grade students having these Chromebooks. Um, we're starting next year in the fall of 2020 with Shadow Mountain High School and we're going to do um, kind of a slow rollout there. Um, we're going to start with freshmen and um, from there uh, our goal is that by the second quarter, we're going to bring on sophomores um, and then um, hopefully by second semester, we'll be able to loop in some even more. So we're working out, we're using Shadow Mountain High School as the, the starting point one because their numbers are low. So we, we don't have a, it's the lowest po student population as far as our high schools are concerned. Um, and we are going to kind of troubleshoot some of the logistical pieces and make sure that we have a good model moving forward. Um, and then the reason why we're doing this is uh, one, we feel that it's innovative. We feel that it's competitive in the sense that our neighboring districts and charter schools are um, currently utilizing similar models. Um, more fiscally responsible in the sense that um, right now we have roughly about 46,000 Chromebooks uh, across our district and our student enrollment is well below that, but yet we still have campuses that don't have one-to-one -one, and it, it's just because of how we're, uh, we're currently utilizing and allocating those, those devices. So if we attach one device to a student and that follows them from classroom to classroom, um, it'll actually save us uh, money in the long run. Um, and then the, the idea of uh, creating this student responsibility 
um, and having them have some ownership in this. Um, that was a, another point that we thought was important with this whole rollout. Okay, uh, thanks, Sam. Um, you're going to hear about uh, three programs here a little bit. Uh, all, all, both Oceana and Alley, and Alley is now on, and uh, they both belong to WIT, which is our Women and in Information Technology Program, that was started a number of years ago when we noted uh, there weren't enough females, enough uh, girls in the uh, in our technical classes, except bio. In bio classes, it was about 50-50, but we didn't see it in systems engineering or video editing or uh, computer science or any of this kind of thing. And that was right about the same time nationally and internationally, they were seeing the same problem, that uh, uh, there, there weren't enough females. I think the national average is about 21 to 22 percent in technical roles, females in professional jobs. And uh, in cybersecurity, it's 9% uh, female. And um, we didn't think that was right, number one. And number two, we thought we're missing out on 50% of the innovation. So um, the, the more complex problem it is, the more you need diversity, and thus WIT was started. And it's, it's a heck of a program. Uh, you're also going to hear about data governance and cybersecurity task force. Both of these students serve on it. They're going to speak to it. And uh, we have a, a, a real robust digital citizenship uh, program trying to uh, uh, embed ethics and, and just because you can doesn't necessarily mean you should, sh should type scenarios. So you're going to hear about that. If you go to the next slide, I think it uh, turns uh, right over to Oceana. Yes, thank you. So for the Data Governance and Cybersecurity Task Force, as you can see, there is very wide district participation, including Ali and myself are the two students on the council, on the task force. So basically what we're trying to work towards is to enhance the use of and as well as our resources, both our data and cyber resources, with the district working together with the stakeholders, including you guys, especially through focusing on protecting data and our other resources through the methods described in the mission statement that you can see on the slide. Informa more information if you don't see it on, if you don't get a chance to ask us more questions or if you don't see it on our slideshow, you can go to dg.pvschools.net and you can find more information about the data governance and cybersecurity task force on that website. So we'll go on to the next slide. So some of our main purposes are to focus on privacy, confidentiality, integrity, availability, and security. And we do that by some of our on on, sorry, ongoing case files that we have to, the ca have to cabinet, as you can see from the picture on the screen. And we also do that through things like the student data principles, the apps and privacy, as well as the employee responsibilities. So we'll go along to the next slide. So what we try to focus on for employee responsibilities is to really help employees recognize cl different sensitivity in data class, different class sensitivities for the data that we have and really be on the front line for protecting student data. So as you can see on the slide, there's class one, two, and three. And those are the rules that we're trying to help employees understand for what data should be shared and what data should not be shared. For the apps and privacy, we've been trying, to, we've been using an app called Common Sense Media to evaluate all of the apps that we're using in our district, such as Google Classroom, Quizlet, and Remind. So we're trying, when we give the, we're trying to give the teachers these different evaluations on the apps that we're using and other apps that they ask for us to, for to other apps that we have to use in our district. So if it's a pass, then it's a pass or a warning. It's perfectly fine for the teachers to use. But for the warning, we try to help the teachers understand why there's a privacy problem, why there could be a possible security issue in that app. And if it's a fail, then we try, then it's we're not allowed to use it because of obvious privacy reasons. So on to the next slide. And I'll so, turn it over to Ali. 
Oceana, thank you. Yes, Allie, uh, proceed ahead. Tell us a little bit about what's going on here. Thank you, Mr. Billings. Sorry, I also hopped on a little bit late there, but so I want to talk to you guys about a little bit of what we did for WIT over the past year, starting with last summer. We actually went to Cisco Live uh, in San Diego, which I don't know if anyone really knows what that is. It was supposedly a 21 and over event, so I didn't really know what Mr. Billings had to do to get us there, but he has a way of getting things done. And it was a really great opportunity for those of us in WIT. Um, we were actually doing a Cyber Patriots program, but we decided to take a little side quest there and we started piloting a Cisco sort of class, really. It's more of a simulation, but we ended up presenting that at Cisco Live about five times. I think we thought we were going to present like once, but you never know what's going to happen. And going into this, I had a little bit of a misconception about what executives were like. That was completely blown away after this. And we kind of thought that they were all serious, and, you know, business like, and we met all these people at Cisco and then we realized that it actually takes quite a bit of charisma to get where you are. And you can even see that in that photo down there, took pictures with a lot of the people we presented to. Um, this wasn't actually in the real venue, but we were in a hotel, which was very fancy, took advantage of all the tea there. But we talked to all these people, we took lots of pictures, shook hands, and we really got to learn what it was like in that business world. And continuing on here, we also had a little bit of fun. We played four way ping pong. We tried to ask Mr. Billings to get one for us. We tried. It didn't work. I think it's a, necess a necessity, but you know, we all have our opinions. So we had our turns getting interviewed too. So we got to see what that process was like. It was interesting to see everything that goes into those interviews. I mean, I was kind of just sitting on the couch doing my own thing, drinking some fancy hotel tea. And so they come over to interview me. I try and sit all proper, but they told me to stay where I am. So I had to tell my mom in advance before she saw the picture that they told me to sit like that. And that's why I'm not being all ladylike because she doesn't like that. So, but we also got to try a couple things. Ellie was getting interviewed in front of the Cisco sign. And so they posted that on their Instagram. So that was really cool. I think a lot of people saw that. We got to talk to some people about their products. So not just networking too, we were also learning about the technology. We did more than just present. And they're also piloting some really cool technology. Uh, I think that's me right there. We were playing with the virtual reality and they were actually showing us the way that they do exams with virtual reality. So I know you can't see it, but I was in a data center plugging things in and probably dropping the cords everywhere. So yeah. And next, next fun thing that we're doing in, um, in Cyber Patriots is, thank you. Um, sorry, I just saw that comment. But we, were, we went back to what we were originally trying to do, which was training for a competition called Cyber Patriots, which is a cybersecurity competition. Um, so we decided to have an all girls team for that. We made it to the gold league, which there's like three leagues. There's like silver, gold, and platinum. I think we're proud of ourselves for making that since a lot of the competition we were up against was multi-year, 88%. So a little bit intimidating, but we still had a lot of fun. And so we had our chaperones, um, brought us snacks. So that was always a plus. <laughs> And one of the other wonderful opportunities that we have in the WIT program in Cyber and Cyber Patriots is we're currently working towards a Microsoft Security Fundamentals towards that certification. And we're also working towards the CompTIA Security Plus certification, which for those of you who don't know, it's a pretty big certification. So it's really exciting that we get to be a part of it. 
and that we have this chance to get certifications that will help us later on in life. And several, several of us have also had other opportunities to get Microsoft certifications through our computer science classes or through other out through the district in other ways. And if we're successful in getting the Security Plus certification, then it will be opened up to other students in our district as well. Next slide, please. Before, Ellie, uh, yes. excuse me. She's being way too humble on the cyber Cisco cybersecurity. It's important for parents to understand that high school students had never participated, let alone present at this international conference. It's about 25,000 uh, attendees. It's huge. It's a major deal. And they were stunned. Uh, several of the girls got job offers while we were there. And we were like, uh, uh, we, we're here as chaperones. That's between you and the parents and all of that kind of thing. So I just wanted to point that out. Please proceed, Allie. Sorry. That's okay. I did forget to mention about the job offers. I'm still jobless. So, you know, up for grabs if any of them want to contact me. But we'll see about that. <laughs> I think I might need to graduate first. Anyways. Um, I think I want to keep it a little bit short on artificial intelligence, but this is one of the things that we really focused on during the WIT internship during the summer, which is another one of the things we did. We have a lot of girls go to the ITC over the summer and we get to learn about technology and take classes. Uh, we learn a lot of good team skills working together, getting to know other girls that are into the same things we are, which is a huge thing really because I think engineering class I've ever been in, and there's probably been one or two other girls, if I'm lucky. But artificial intelligence, um, it's not this big bad thing that a lot of people may think it is. Yes, it's your creepily specific Facebook ads, but it's also useful in medical fields and maybe just about every field you can think of. Um, and I actually one of the reasons why data has become such a prominent issue these days is if you need to train a machine learning algorithm you need the data for it and it takes a lot of data especially for the more ambitious stuff so you need to take that data you train it you kind of tell it what's what if you're going with supervised learning which is a whole other distinction but you have to make sure that it's doing things right. Uh, sometimes it'll classify, you know, you know, we have like a little duck example there. We don't want it to think a rabbit's a duck. I've personally been thinking of training some kind of AI algorithm to figure out whether or not a hot dog's a sandwich or not. But you have to see about that. So, and then you have under-supervised learning, which if you go on to the next slide, you very much. So deep learning is your unsupervised learning um, a lot, and not all the time, but there's a lot more layers to it. And I think one of the reasons why they call it artificial intelligence is actually because it's really based off of the human brain in a way, in which you have these neurons which are kind of directing information the same way that human neurons do. Obviously, you've yet to give uh, computer like real emotions. I think there's a lot more chemicals that go into that than computer magic. But so yeah, uh, one of the really prominent like deep learning tools right now is TensorFlow. I know that's what Google uses a lot. Which Google Google's applications being a great example of deep learning. So. I don't know who's doing the slides, but thank you very much. So with all of with all that you may have heard of AI, there's one of the main one of the crucial parts to AI as we're building it and as it has been built is are the ethics in AI. Ethics are can hopefully keep a both AI and the humans creating AI from doing the wrong things which is why it's really important to make sure that the ethics and the code of ethics that people are creating for AI comes from people who are very 
are from very diverse backgrounds, religious, different religions, different races, different cultural backgrounds, and are very ethical people as well. This is especially important in privacy because honestly, there's inf almost everything that we do on the internet is being recorded. So there's a lot of data on ourselves, on other people, on different different topics that are out that's out on the internet that we need to make sure is being protected, which is why we need to make sure that AI uses the information properly so that there is still the necessary privacy for each and every person. There are also some issues with AI and bias. For depending on the information that we give AI as Ali, artificial intelligence, as Ali mentioned in the last slides. For example, Google, Amazon created a program to hire people for different jobs, but it found that there was a bias against women simply because there was more input for male applications than there were for female applications. So as, as you can see, AI is very fragile and we need to make sure that the code of ethics that we're putting into AI is as firm as it can be so that AI and humans can make the right decisions. However, this can be challenging because everyone, morals and ethics can vary from person to person, which is why it's very important that we get that diverse ethical group together so that we can have the best code of ethics possible. AI is also affecting the AI is also affecting the workforce worldwide in job development and displacement. And I would also like to go into what AI can and cannot do. So we'll go to the next slide. This is just a fun example of an artificial intelligence robot. So Sophia is a robot and she is a social humanoid robot. And she is actually the very first robot to have been granted an honorary citizenship in a country, which country is Saudi Arabia. So moving on to the next slide. Are there any guesses for what the estimated displacement is by the year 2030? Any guesses? The estimated displacement of jobs by machine learning and artificial intelligence by the year 2030 is between 400 and 800 million jobs with about 375 million jobs being people switching job categories completely. However, this is, there are some very good things that can come out of this. And for example, more jobs in the area of artificial intelligence and machine learning and also in being technology. So moving on to the next slide. Let's go on to what AI can and cannot do before anyone gets worried about the job displacement. So the three C's are what's difficult for AI, complexity, creativity, and compassion. So some examples of these jobs are intricate automotive repair for complexity, an artist like Bob Ross for creativity, and compassion as in for jobs such as teachers or psychologists, these are all things that, AI, that are very, very difficult for AI and that it's very unlikely for AI to go into, any, into jobs that are focused on any of these categories. However, what the things that are easier for AI to do and what's easy for us to implement AI into are optimization, routine, and repetition. So efficiency, regular sequence of events, or a lot of repetition or a lot of repetition in a job, such as drivers, bank tellers, or telemarketers. However, something that is very, very important to remember with AI is that AI, is make, AI has a very positive impact on our world. Yes, there will be job displacements, but that job displacement and will also develop the workforce into something that will be a lot more meaningful for everyone that is in the workforce and can help us to have more time to spend with our family and friends and to really make those deep connections, deep and meaningful connections with other human beings in our jobs. Turn it back over to Ali. We're back to WIT presentations, in case you haven't had enough of that. 
uh, presentation section kind of. But, <laughs> so just a couple of other things that we've gotten to do in terms of you know, speaking to other people and working on our presentation skills. Uh, this is actually pretty recent before this whole COVID-19 thing. We had Oceana and another one of our WIT students, Megan, they went to ASU for a panel, I think. You can correct me if I'm wrong on any of this. That's correct. I want to make sure I'm not spouting anything that's not. So this is a lot more networking opportunities too. So while we're working on our public speaking skills, we're also working on speaking to people one-on-one -on -one after the presentations. Uh, in the bottom corner, that's us and Dr. Welsh, who I'm sure was speaking earlier before I hopped on. Uh, we actually went to a um, CIO. Um, well, that was a different thing, I think. I'm already getting all these things messed up because we just get so many opportunities with this, but it was a collective thing with a lot of mayors, public officials. So we were talking about the future of Arizona technology wise. And so we got to present a, a web app, a web app that we were actually working on for a couple months before that, which has a lot to do with high bandwidth, the fiber we were talking about earlier and what that means for musicians. We talked about artificial intelligence. We had another presentation about that at the DAC. That's up there in the top left corner, I think. And yeah, back, I think in the bottom, that's actually Megan talking to a woman. I think she's from Kuwait. She's the CIO of an oil company in the Middle East. So got to meet some really powerful people, got to get advice on how they got there. And we really just learned that there's a lot of different paths you can take just to, it doesn't matter where you start, it really just matters where you end up. there we go all right and then last but definitely not least a huge thank you to you guys as parents for all that you do and especially during this time i know it's challenging um but thank you for the opportunity um that you give us every day um also thank you for investing in pv and choosing paradise valley and for your time today um are there any questions and what i'm seeing is if you have any questions if you want to just type them in the chat we can go ahead and address them So I'll, I'll try to answer one question. How do students join WIT? It's a recommendation from the school, but they can contact me or Sam directly, and we can start from there. Um, WIT right now is probably, uh, well, we were do doing TGIFs where we start doing uh, the high school girls articulate to the junior high girls. Right now, probably like 15 uh, muscle man, eh, it might be 20, uh, the cyber securities is one, um, complexity, mathematics, internships. We had a partnership going on with CTE this summer that might or might not happen. Uh, and then, uh, tech girls innovating on Friday is kind of a neat thing between high school girls and junior high school girls. So uh, at the core, probably 20 students. And then I'll jump in for the next question. Um, how will connectivity work for students with take home devices? So I'm going to kind of answer this twofold. So for right now, with our current reality, um, we are working with uh, Cox for the Connect to Compete and um, getting families pre approved to um, get them 60 days. And in some situations, um, we're getting up to four months um, using grant money. Um, of free internet for those families. So that's kind of one end of it to get us through this current reality that we're in. Um, and then secondly, we're looking at some, I know Jeff is looking at some long-term partnerships with Cox and um, some, some ways that we can connect with them to where when we do uh, roll out take-home devices for students that there are um, ways that we can ensure that uh, if we're, if we're gonna say that this is equity, that we're making sure that those um, students that may not be able to 
um, have internet, have access to internet at home, that we're doing something to bridge that gap. So um, lots of different conversations going on right now. Um, anything from hotspots to partnerships with Cox and working through that. Um, but yeah, we're that's definitely a hot topic and something that is on our radar as we roll this out. And then do one of you, Allie or Oceana, want to take that next question as to um, how has this affected any of your interests for what you want to do after graduation? Oh, sure. Oops. Uh, Oceana, you want to go first? Sure. For me, then, it's it's been a major factor in affecting what I want to go into after graduation. I'm When I first went into high school, I was thinking maybe something more in biology, something more in the biotechnology industry. But ever since joining the WIT program and Cyber Patriots and the Data Governance and Cybersecurity Task Force, then I've been a lot I've been leaning a lot more towards cybersecurity and something in that field. So um, I've always kind of changed what I've been wanting to do, but this has definitely have been fa a big factor in, you know, actually deciding what I want to do, especially with college coming up. For me, it's going to be about graduating next year, so crazy. But I think when I came into it, I, want, I was either wanting to do aerospace or like mechanical engineering or something. And then I came in and Mr. Billings is really good about working with us about what we're interested in. I showed an interest in fractal geometry of all things, and you never guess it, but it was actually from reading Jurassic Park. <laughs> so he got me on to a complexity course, and now I have a huge passion for math, which I wouldn't have guessed in like sixth grade. So that is currently what I want to major in. I might end up switching to physics depending on what I find more practical at the time. To me, it's kind of the same thing, really. Physics and math go hand in hand. So, yeah, I think that's where I'm going now with this. Ali and Oceana, if, if you would, the, the impact of COVID and the distancing, uh, what has that meant for you in terms of continuing your schooling during this time? What, do, what have you noted? Easier, harder, messier, what? I mean, personally, I like it better. I do miss, uh, miss the social aspect. There is always being able to see my friends and work with other people. But when it comes to the actually learning side of it, I found that it's sort of an interesting experiment because especially with the way we're doing grading for a lot of classes other than the AP classes um, where it's the same grade as last quarter I've actually been able to focus on learning instead of the grades so I'm kind of picking and choosing what I'm doing based on how much it's going to help me learn the subject and it's amazing how much you want to do if you don't technically have to <laughs> so yeah because we're so we're very used to the AZ merit and you know the A's and the B's and all that and now it's just like I'm doing my chemistry homework because I want, want to learn chem not because I need an A in the class it's sort of like when I'm doing the dishes and my mom asked me to do the dishes but I no longer want to do the dishes because I was asked to <laughs> so which probably doesn't sound that great but it's a lot easier to want to do something when it's up to you I definitely agree. For me, it's been it's been really nice because not only have I had less that I have to do, but also I've had more opportunities to grow in different in other ways aside from the schoolwork as well. Because I've had more time to spend with my family, more time to learn different skills, pick up new hobbies. Although in in our school learning, I've I've really enjoyed the online learning because it's. Like Ali, it's helped me to put the focus back on the learning and want to learn instead of having to learn. Yeah, I think my sleep schedule is a lot better. Well, maybe not the schedule, but I'm getting eight hours of sleep a day now. So that's new. That's also been awesome. Awesome. Thank you, ladies. And I think the last question that I saw was just on a plan for getting these devices that were sent out back. And 
Yes, we are working on that. Um, a lot of it plan, is kind uh, Excuse of, me, Sam. The plan is Sam's going to figure it out. Yeah, that's Jeff's uh, go-to answer. Um, so yes, Sam and team will figure it out. But um, really what we're what it's contingent on is um, come the end of May where we're at with this whole COVID-19 situation. Um, our initial thoughts are we're going to do something very similar to how we uh, obviously learning from and growing, but um, something similar to how we did uh, device distribution. Um, the beauty and the idea of why we took the devices from the high school campuses was because, like I had presented to you guys earlier, the goal is that um, we're going to get those campuses um, within the next few years, um, high school campuses especially, probably within the next two to three years, um, we'll all have uh, take-home devices. And when we start at a new high school, we're going to start with brand new, fresh devices. So in that case, um, when we take those devices from the high school campus, if either A, they don't make it back, or B, um, they make it back, but they're somewhere else, um, it's not as much of a logistical nightmare um, as if we took them from all over. I know some campuses did in round two, kind of, um, they checked out their own devices. And in those cases, um, we would have them return them back to the same campus that they got them from. So um, again, working through logistics, trying to kind of uh, play it by ear and see where we're at come the end of May, but uh, definitely communication will come out about those. And then will students possibly be able to keep Chromebooks over the summer to continue learning? Um, that is a great question and something that I would have to uh, discuss with the higher ups and see if that's something that we want to um, pose. Um, I know that uh, the one hesitation that I have with that is just um, because these were high school devices, um, I know that there's a lot of learning um, and not only just learning, but assessments that take place at the beginning of the year. So making sure that um, however we reallocate these devices or whatever happens to them, that our high school campuses are ready to go and equipped um, come August. So um, that might pose a little bit of a challenge, but I know we've had conversations as far as um, summer school or um, situations like that, where definitely that would that would be a possibility. And then as we work out summer programs opportunities, um, yeah, so definitely that that's something that we will talk about with um, Cabinet and Jeff and myself and see if there's a plan or a way that we can um, roll that out as an option. Um, but yeah, more communication definitely to come on how we're going to get devices back and the time frame. No sense talking to me. I vote whatever your plan is. You can visit with Cabinet. <laughs> yeah, but if you and I talk, I can at least blame you. Yeah, I don't want to talk. Yeah. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, thank you all very much. Uh, and uh, we appreciate it. And and um, we're glad to have the opportunity to, to try to help help kids and champion them. And, and um, we appreciate you alls investment and guidance. So thank you. Yeah, thank you, guys. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. It was nice to see everyone, even though I can't really see everyone, but you know what I mean. I agree.